Hey, great. So you got the uh, award out of the way. But as, as we say, there is a best poster award at the end, so it's still exciting, and this will be all handed out on, on Wednesday. So now it's my absolute great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, the, re the, the, the second highlight of, of Middle After the Best Paper Award. Um, so we are, we are very fortunate to have three excellent speakers here, but so Michael is doing the first one today. Um, Michael is a professor at Imperial College London, so he's a colleague of mine, I'm proud of that. Where he, where he holds the chair in machine learning and pattern recognition. He's out also recently uh, becoming the head of graph learning research at Twitter. His main research expertise is in theoretical comput computational methods for geometric data analysis, a field which he has published extensively, as many of you know and might have read his uh, many, many papers. Uh, he's really one of the pioneers in geometric deep learning, which is what he will be talking about today. Uh, a methodological area which is very relevant to, to the field of biomedical image computing. Uh, he has received his PhD from Technion in Israel in 2007. Uh, he has held several visiting appointments at Stanford, MIT, Harvard, Tel Aviv University. Uh, he, it's between 2017 and 18, he was a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. Uh, and since 2017, he's also a Rudolf Diesel Fellow uh, at the Institute of Advanced Study at my home university, TU Munich. And Michael is the recipient of four ERC grants. He's a fellow of IEEE, ARPR, ACM Distinguished Speaker, and he's a World Economic Forum Young Scientist. His industrial experience includes technological leadership. He has founded a couple of companies and uh, successful startup companies, including Novafora, Envision, and many others. And Recently, his company Fabula A was acquired by Twitter just a couple of weeks ago, I believe. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Michael. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for the introduction. Great to be here. So, actually, my first time at Middle, and uh, it's actually great, maybe a coincidence, that there is a graph in the logo of the conference. So, I will be talking about geometric deep learning, which encompasses learning on graphs and manifolds, basically non-Euclidean structured data. And uh, I guess I don't need to tell here that uh, there is a lot of uh, interest and attention in... Oh, this thing doesn't work. How should I use it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's, now it's working. So um, this is probably a slide that you've seen a, a million of times. Uh, basically, the success of uh, deep learning in computer vision was quite quite remarkable. It probably wiped out uh, wiped out all the existing methods uh, before. And now, if you go to a conference like CVPR, it is totally different from what it used to be about a decade ago. But if we look at the main focus of research in uh, deep learning, it is focused primarily on data with underlying Euclidean structures, basically where the signal lies on a grid such as images or acoustic signals, and we need to deal in many applications with a different kind of data which doesn't have grid-like structure, and these are graphs, manifolds, and uh, uh, basically this kind of data. Uh, the, probably the most prominent examples are social networks. You can think of Facebook or Twitter social graph that, uh, can you hear me well? Uh, so you can, if you think of a social network such as uh, Facebook or Twitter, Basically, uh, uh, this is a graph that contains uh, hundreds of millions or sometimes even billions of nodes representing users, and uh, the edges represent some relations, connections between them. And you can also, basically, you can think of graphs as a very universal model uh, for relations or interactions between different things. You can uh, use graphs, for example, to model uh, molecules in computational chemistry. In medical imaging domain, you can use it to model functional networks of the brain. In computer graphics and also in medical imaging, I guess you can use it to model three-dimensional shapes as meshes. And uh, basically, uh, this is a new field that we call uh, geometric deep learning. It has been uh, very rapidly evolving in the past several years. And you can find quite successful applications of these methods uh, in a very broad spectrum of applications from recommender systems to high energy physics. We did a paper on uh, neutrino detection using uh, geometric deep learning. Fake news detection, that was a company that was acquired by Twitter, as Ben mentioned. Uh, drug repositioning, uh, cool work from Stanford. Uh, 
and computational chemistry where uh, these methods could potentially be revolutionary. And the, this weird name, uh, geometric deep learning, so basically it comes from a paper that we published a couple of years ago, which was probably the first uh, position paper in this domain that, that in a little bit uh, ignited this, uh, the interest in this field. So uh, uh, you can think of it as uh, a way of uh, thinking of operations on these domains uh, from the intrinsic standpoint. Now, let me give you a, a little bit of an overview of different applications or different classes of problems that we can encounter in this field. And I will make analogies to, to more familiar problems from the domain of computer vision. So uh, one application is uh, what we can call graph-wise uh, classification. So if you think of a graph that models, let's say, a chemical molecule, so vertices will be atoms and edges represent uh, uh, chemical bonds. So here we want to predict some property of this molecule. For example, we want to decide whether it will be toxic or not. Right? So we, so we start with some features that live on the nodes and the vertices of this graph, and we aggregate it into a single vector that represents the entire graph. Right? So if I make an analogy to computer vision, this is like uh, image recognition. I want to tell whether this object is a cat or a dog or something else. Right? A different application, you can think of vertex-wise or edge-wise classification where we have a network, let's say a social network of users, and in, in your field it could be, for example, a network of patients. We have some information about these, uh, these users, and we want to make prediction about each individual user. So, for example, we want in computational social science applications, we would like to tell, for example, we'd like to predict election results, or maybe in uh, biomedical imaging it could be automatic diagnosis. We want to predict whether a person suffers from some disease. So uh, in computer vision, the analogous problem would be uh, segmentation, right? So semantic segmentation, we want to label each pixel in an image, whether it belongs to a person, to background, foreground, and, and so on. We can also distinguish between uh, a class of problems where the domain is fixed, like a social network, at least at some snapshot of time, we can say that this graph is fixed, as opposed to applications where the domain changes. So this is typical problems in computer vision and graphics, where we have, let's say, a collection of 3D shapes on which we learn, and we want now to apply our learned model on uh, a different collection of shapes that we've never seen before. And finally, we can also consider the problem where the domain is unknown, or maybe partially given, or given with noise. So in, uh, in the case of patient networks, for example, we don't really know what are the right relations between patients. What, basically, what's the right way of defining the affinity between them, right? So in these kind of problems, we need to learn the graph together with the filters on the graph, as we'll be talking in a second. So I would say that uh, probably if we look at the history of deep learning, obviously this is a very uh, old field. So it, it has been around from probably the 50s, maybe under different names, right? Artificial neural networks are pretty old. Uh, and we know that uh, basically they are universal approximators. So even a very shallow network with just one hidden layer can approximate any continuous function to any degree of accuracy if it has sufficient number of neurons. So one of the breakthroughs, at least in computer vision applications, was to relinquish this generality for, uh, in favor of some model that incorporates domain knowledge information. In this case, it is uh, uh, shift equivariance. Basically, the idea that we can have a filter that is shared across the image, basically shared weights, local connectivity. And these are convolutional neural networks that are now uh, still state of the art in many computer vision applications. So we can think of basically our uh, case of deep learning on graphs and manifolds in, from a similar perspective. Basically, we want to incorporate some information into the problem that takes into account the local structure or the local invariance that we have on graphs and manifolds. So basically looking at convolutional neural networks as an example, we want to operate in a local way on our non-Euclidean domain, whether it's graph or manifold, so we want to have weight sharing. And in particular, two characteristics of classical CNNs that we are looking into will be the number of parameters. Basically, it's independent on the input size, so you can run a CNN on very large images, potentially. The number of parameters is independent on the size of the input, and the computational complexity. It should scale linearly with the input size. In our case, it will be the number of vertices in the graph. Okay? So we'll try to reproduce these properties uh, in uh, geometric deep learning. And the first question, basically, how do we do convolutions on graphs? Right? So I will start with graphs. I will almost interchangeably use graphs and manifolds. We'll see that on manifolds we have slightly more structure so we can do uh, maybe smarter things. <laughs> 
OK, so basically, uh, one of the core building blocks of convolutional neural networks, uh, filters that we can run over an image, are not uh, well defined on a graph. So at least we need to somehow reinvent the basic concepts. So let, let me just introduce some uh, formalism. So we'll be talking in, uh, with, uh, using the right terms. We'll consider a weighted undirected graph, just for simplicity. So it has some uh, non-negative edge weights. And we assume that we are given scalar valued functions over the vertices. Again, you can make it much more complex. This is just the very basic uh, setting. OK, and one important thing to understand that we cannot add vertices of the graph. This is not a vector space. But the space of functions that live on the graph is a vector space. We can define a standard Hilbert product there. So it's an inner product space. And uh, we will be looking extensively into operators that take a function on the vertices of the graph and uh, produce some other function on the vertices of the graph. That, in, Because everything is finite dimensional, you can think of it as uh, a vector, basically n-dimensional vector where n is the number of vertices. And a particular operator that we'll be interested in is what is called the Laplacian operator. So again, there are many ways of defining the Laplacian, but essentially it looks at the neighbors of a vertex, makes some uh, uh, weighted average of these neighbors, and then subtracts this average from the value of the vertex, uh, the vertex itself. So it's a kind of uh, way of looking at your neighbors and telling how different they are from you, right? So this allows to define uh, a notion of smoothness. I right? can tell whether a function varies significantly or not on the vertices of the graph, right? So this is something that in mathematics or physics is called the Dirichlet norm. Uh, essentially, if the, uh, if the signal is constant on the vertices of the graph, then this norm will be zero. If it varies a little bit, then it will be small. If it varies a lot, it will be large. Now, why this is important? Because we can use the Dirichlet norm to define the smoothest orthogonal basis. Basically, we'll be minimizing the Dirichlet energy for a set of functions that are orthogonal. And this is a very well-known algebraic property that has a closed form solution. Basically, it is given by the eigenvectors of the Laplacian operator. Right? So here, the matrix phi contains as columns the orthogonal eigenvectors. And the matrix lambda contains, is a diagonal matrix that contains the corresponding eigenvalues. Because of the way that we define our operator, uh, it is positive semi-definite matrix. So the eigenvalues will be non-negative. Right? So this is actually a very familiar construction. Maybe we don't realize it. But if we look at the Euclidean one-dimensional Laplacian, the eigenfunctions are the Fourier basis, the sine or cosine functions with uh, integer uh, uh, periods. If we look at general graph, they will look somewhat differently. So here, positive uh, uh, values are represented by red colors, and negative values are represented by, by, uh, by blue colors. And you see that, uh, basically, the eigen uh, vectors here are sorted uh, according to the increasing eigenvalue. So you see that it starts from a constant one that has zero Dirichlet energy, and then the frequency increases and the, the, the signal varies more. So the question is, how do we use this to define convolution on a graph or on a manifold? And in the Euclidean domain, we know that convolution can be defined in two different ways. It can be defined as a spatial operator that has a toplets or circle structure. And using the fact that circuit matrices uh, are diagonalized by the Fourier transform, basically we can also define convolution in the frequency domain as a pointwise product of the Fourier transforms. So we don't have anything similar to shift invariance in the non-Euclidean case, but we can define uh, spectral convolution by analogy. We can just say that it's the product of Fourier transforms of our signals, whereby Fourier transform we understand the projection of our signal on the Fourier basis, basically, phi transpose f. That's the Fourier transform of, of f on, on the graph. right? And here, the circle denotes the pointwise product. Now, this gives us a, a way of defining uh, an analogy of convolutional layer on a graph or on a manifold uh, done in the frequency domain. So we'll be computing the Fourier transform of f, multiplying it by diagonal matrix g containing the Fourier coefficients of the filter. That will be the learnable coefficients and then computing the inverse Fourier transform, multiplying by this matrix phi. Okay, and this now is a basic building block. We can apply multiple such filters, or we can apply non-linearities, we can stack multiple convolutional layers, interleave them with pooling, and so on and so forth. Now, this, is, this was actually one of the first papers that uh, really uh, 
reignited the interest in uh, deep learning on, on, on graphs by Joan Bruna and co-authors. And there are many deficiencies in this method. It's, it's good conceptually, but uh, it is not very practical. First of all, one of the issues is that filters are basis dependent. I will show an example in a second, but you can understand that if I compute the filter, it is computed with respect to some basis. We don't encounter this problem in the Euclidean case because the basis is fixed. Basically, it comes with a domain, which is in the Euclidean case, uh, simple one dimensional, two dimensional grid. Second thing is that here we explicitly assume that the graph is undirected because uh, this gives us a symmetric Laplacian matrix which has orthogonal like in decomposition. If the graph is directed, we don't have orthogonal like in decomposition. Basically, we cannot do this kind of uh, computation. Second thing, again, I will show a, a picture in a second. The kernels uh, or the filters that are derived from this uh, Laplacian will be isotropic. Basically, they filter in the same way in each and every direction. And the number of parameters per layer is order of n. Basically, that's the size of this uh, diagonal matrix, right? That's the number of elements in the matrix. The computational complexity is order of n squared because we need to multiply our signal by this uh, full matrix of uh, Laplacian eigenvectors. We don't have Fourier, uh, fast Fourier transform on graphs usually, so it's complexity of matrix multiplication, n squared, right? So this is way worse than what we've seen in the classical setting where it had order of one complexity in terms of the number of coefficients and order of n in terms of the, the, the computation. And finally, we don't have a guarantee of uh, spatial localization of the filters, which was also one of the key selling points of CNNs that we operate locally. Okay? So let's, let us study all these uh, uh, problems uh, one after another and see how to deal with them. So first is the basis dependence. So here I show you an example on, uh, on a mesh, but on the graph it works in a similar way. So let's say I have some function. So in this case, these will be these red blobs. So it's one at the red blobs and zero elsewhere. And I apply a filter in the spectral way as we defined before. So I compute the Fourier transform, multiply by the diagonal matrix of some coefficients, and uh, compute the inverse Fourier transform, right? And here the filter does some kind of edge detection operation. Okay, so I computed these coefficients in the, in the Fourier domain. Now, I will take exactly this domain and I will slightly deform it, almost isometrically. Uh, but do you think that the result of the filter will remain the same? So I'm using slight, uh, the same signal. I will slightly modify the domain. The Laplacian operator as a result will change as well. The eigenfunctions probably will change in some way, but I keep the same filter coefficients. So the result looks dramatically different, right? This is what I meant by uh, the basis dependence. And this is not surprising because we know that especially at high frequencies, eigenvectors may change. You might have slight uh, switches of orders of eigenvalues. So if I look at the 15th eigenvector of the Laplacian, you see that it changes a lot as a result of the domain deformations. So second problem that we encountered was isotropic filters. And basically Laplacian operator by its definition in the Euclidean case is rotation invariant. On the general graph, it is locally permutation invariant, right? It doesn't care about the order of your neighbors. And in the Euclidean case, we know that the Laplacian is invariant to rotations, so every filter that we get on a grid will look like this, right? So if I told you in computer vision that this is the kind of filters you will be working with, you will tell me that this is very boring, and you will probably be right. Second thing, or third thing, that uh, the deficiency that we observed was lack of localization. And here, actually, we can say something. And we know that uh, in classical free analysis, there is a relation between the uh, high order moments of a uh, signal and the high order derivatives of its Fourier transform. And basically, if we want spatial localization, we want the high order moments of the function to vanish, meaning that the high order derivatives of the Fourier transform must vanish. In other words, meaning that the function is smooth. So basically, we can impose localization in space by requiring that the Fourier transform is smooth. Here, we, basically, there is some caveat, some technical challenge, what is exactly defined by the smoothness in the, in the non-Euclidean ca case. And uh, somehow, it has to do with the way that we structure or order our eigenvalues, our frequencies. And I will not go into this detail. Basically, we have usually only one dimensional order for our frequencies. So we can just say that our filter is a smooth 
uh, function, you can think of it as a spectral transfer function with respect to the frequency variable lambda, the eigenvalue. So we'll be applying this filter to the Laplacian operator, right? And of course, the application of the filter is intended in the operator sense. We'll be applying it to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So basically, it's a scalar function that changes the, each of the eigenvalues, right? So that's the transfer function. And we can just uh, require this function to be smooth, and maybe even we can parameterize it by a small number of parameters. So let's call the parameters alpha. This way, we also get a filter that is parameterized by order of one parameters, as we wanted. Okay. So this is just an illustration of how this localization works. If I have a non-smooth filter in the frequency domain, when I apply it to a delta function that is shown here by the white point, you see that uh, the, the result is delocalized. And if the filter is smooth, you see that I get much better localization. Okay, so it works in practice. Now, the easiest uh, smooth function that you can think of is a polynomial, right? So you can think of polynomial of degree r. You apply it to your frequency, right? So you, when you apply it to the Laplacian operator, you actually need just to take powers of the Laplacian. And basically, you can apply it in principle also to directed graphs because you just multiply your function by these powers of the Laplacian. Uh, the kernels, as we've seen before, are isotropic, unless you do something with the way you define the Laplacian. Uh, the number of parameters is actually the number of uh, coefficients of the polynomial. It's independent on the input size, so it's order of one. And the filters also have guaranteed r hope support. So basically, if you think of the Laplacian, it touches only your neighbors. If you take the square of the Laplacian, it touches the neighbors of the neighbors. If you take r power of the Laplacian, it touches r times removed neighbors. And probably the most important thing is that you don't need to explicitly compute the eigenvectors here because uh, in order to apply this function, you just multiply your signal by powers of the Laplacian. So if the Laplacian is sparse, which will be usually the case with sparsely connected graphs, uh, this will be order of n uh, computational complexity, right? So this was a very nice work uh, by uh, Michael de Ferrara and co-authors. And uh, they actually applied it to, to multiple interesting settings. Uh, here, what I show is a citation network. So each vertex in a graph represents a, a paper. And the edges represent citations. So obviously, this should be a directed graph. But for simplicity, we make it undirected. And each vertex is described by, let's say, a frequency of different words that appear in the abstract of the paper. So there is some feature vector that lives in each vertex. And the goal is to classify the papers according to the venue where they were published. So whether it's a physics paper, let's say, or a computer vision paper. And we know the labels for some of the vertices. So this is sometimes called semi-supervised setting. We want to predict all the rest of the, of the vertices. And uh, they showed quite significant improvement, uh, improvement over uh, previous uh, approaches. Uh, you can see uh, Cora is uh, the MNIST of graph uh, uh, or network science. It is a tiny uh, citation network with about 5,000 vertices. There have been also interesting applications of these methods uh, in the medical imaging community. Uh, one work done here in the group of uh, uh, Daniel Ruckert, basically where they considered the network of patients where each vertex of the graph is a patient and uh, the, uh, uh, the patients are uh, linked by edges if they have similar properties like similar age or similar gender or maybe some other uh, things like uh, a disease history. And basically, they show that uh, this way you can label the graph, basically by predicting whether a patient has certain disorder or not, uh, in a better way than if you consider a patient separately. So there is somehow a crowd wisdom if you uh, accumulate information from multiple patients in a smart way. Uh, there, was, uh, there were several extensions of this work, uh, one in particular to mention from uh, the group of Navab at TUM. So let's look a little bit uh, uh, more in depth at these uh, polynomial filters that we've seen before. And for this purpose, let's consider a synthetic graph. But this kind of graph is uh, very representative of uh, many uh, real situations, many real networks that we encounter in, in social science, for example, or uh, in biology. So basically, it's a network with communities. So we see here uh, multiple uh, groups of vertices that are strongly connected with each other. So there are many edges between these vertices. And they're weakly connected across communities. So there are, few, uh, uh, there are few connections across the communities. And there are actually probabilistic models that describe these kind of graphs. And again, they emerge very naturally in, uh, in, in the social sciences, in, in biology, and so on. So if we look at the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, 
we see there will be a few near zero eigenvalues, then there will be some, some spectral gap and there will be some higher uh, uh, eigenvalues. So basically the first eigenvalues actually correspond to these communities. If the communities were totally disjoint, I will get an eigenvalue zero with the multiplicity equal to the number of communities. If you think of it, this is how spectral clustering works. Because there, is, there are some connections, these eigenvalues are not exactly zero, but they're almost zero, right? So if I were to detect communities in this graph, basically I need only this information contained at the low frequencies. All these high frequencies are noise, right? So if I plotted my polynomial filters that I've seen before, here are the lines, I don't know if you can see them on this screen, represent the frequencies. So you can think of it as a non-uniformly sampled frequency where the low frequency contains all the information, the high frequency contains the noise. I need really to localize these filters at the low frequencies. And it is very challenging because with polynomials, they are very smooth. I will need very high degrees to localize them. And as a result, everything will be numerically unstable. So we need to do something better, and something better is rational filters. So if you're familiar with uh, these terms in signal processing, you can think of uh, basically the difference between finite impulse response and infinite impulse response filters. So there are several ways of doing it. We uh, opted for the following method, basically that is based on the Kiley transform. It's a complex uh, function that uh, maps uh, bijectively, smoothly, real numbers to the unit complex, uh, complex circle. And because we'll be applying it to a positive uh, semi-definite matrix, basically to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, uh, we are interested on the in half uh, complex circle. We can also scale it uh, by uh, this parameter h, which we call the spectral zoom. And this way we can actually zoom in or out into our low frequency band. We can also, of course, zoom into other bands, but here in particular we are interested in frequencies around zero. So this parameter will be a learnable parameter. It will allow us to focus all the uh, resolution of our filters at the right frequencies. And basically we apply polynomials to this Kiley transform. So you can see that the, result, uh, the resulting filter is a rational function. And uh, it is applied exactly in the same way as before. So basically it is also a function that is expressed in terms of simple matrix vector operations. The only extra operation we add here is inversion. So it works similarly to the, to the polynomial filters. Uh, if you were to invert the matrix uh, uh, accurately, it will require cubic complexity. Here we resort to approximate inversion using, for example, Jacobi algorithm. So it still has linear complexity though with higher multiplicative constant. And uh, here you can see an example. So this is a sanity check on uh, Euclidean grid. So these are how the polynomial filters of different order look like. These are the rational filters with uh, the Kiley transform. And uh, basically, going back to the problem of community detection, you can see that we can get much better localized filters at the right frequencies. And as a result, the accuracy of the community detection will be much better. And you can see that we need just a few Jacobi iterations to invert approximately the, 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 our matrices. And uh, for low degree, we get significantly better performance compared to the polynomial filters and the complexity is still linear. Okay, and we show that uh, it can perform significantly better compared to the polynomial filters. So let me say a few words about pooling. So in the case of uh, grids, pooling is a very simple thing, right? You want to downsample your uh, input, so you just uh, take blocks of pixels and aggregate them into a single pixel, usually nonlinear operations such as maximum. So we can do something similar on graphs. Basically, we need to course in the graph, and there are many ways of doing it. One of the popular ones is the, the Grackler's algorithm. So you really collapse uh, edges and unite, uh, you merge vertices that, that share an edge. And this way, you can represent the coarsening structure as a binary tree. Now, there are many ways uh, of doing coarsening, so it makes sense in some situations to actually learn the pooling. And there have been recent papers from Stanford and Cambridge that try to do it. So basically, you can make a differentiable pooling with some learnable parameters and uh, learn it together with the filters. So pooling is important in an application where you start with a graph and you want to uh, arrive at a decision that regards the entire graph. And in this case, you can take fMRI signals in the brain. So there are different regions in the brain that are activated differently. And you can aggregate this information into a single decision, for example, to classify a disease. So in this application, also from the, the group of Daniel, uh, uh, you can use uh, fMRI signals to do very accurate 
sex classification. So apparently males and females produce different uh, fMRI signals and the graph here represents the, the, the right uh, geometric structure on which the signals live. You can also uh, do cancer type classification. So in this case, uh, you have a matrix of uh, different patients and different gene expressions and the gene expression signal is actually, uh, it is correct to think of it as uh, a signal on a graph, a protein to protein interaction network or a, a gene network. Basically different genes uh, are related to each other in different ways and this is captured by the, the PPI network. So uh, it produces better results than just considering it as Euclidean vector. So bringing the right structure into the problem apparently helps a lot. And uh, our own paper, uh, just published in Nature Scientific Reports a few days ago, we looked at uh, food-based molecules that have uh, drug-like uh, uh, drug properties. Basically, they, we, we tried to find molecules in, uh, in plant-based ingredients where, uh, they, 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 that might have similar therapeutic problem, uh, properties as, uh, uh, as FDA-approved drugs. So there as well, we use PPI networks in order to propagate uh, information correctly. So let me say a few words about uh, matrix completion and recommender system problems. So uh, you're probably familiar with Netflix. It's a very famous uh, movie rental company. And one of the problems uh, that, that Netflix and many other internet companies uh, face is how to recommend content to users. So mathematically, you can think of it as a very large matrix. So you have probably uh, tens or even hundreds of millions of users you have uh, hundreds of thousands of different titles and you want to predict whether a user will like a movie or not, right? So uh, you can represent these as scores that the users can give to different movies, right? Let's say from one to five. And this matrix is very sparse because even if I'm user continuously watching movies on Netflix, probably in my entire lifetime, I can uh, watch that many movies. So we have just a few samples for, uh, for users and we want to fill in the missing information. So the typical way that these problems are approached is algebraically. Basically, we want to fit some low rank matrix that minimizes, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, is consistent with the data. So this is an NP hard problem. It can be replaced by some convex proxy. So all the domain of compressed sensing essentially deals with these kind of, uh, these kind of problems. Uh, usually the constraint is replaced by a penalty. So that's the kind of problems that are used for uh, uh, for matrix completion. Now, if you look at this problem closely, it doesn't have any geometric structure, right? So if I shuffle the columns or the rows of the matrix, I will not change its algebraic properties. If a new user comes that has net, not seen any movie on Netflix, what is called a cold start problem, I have infinitely many ways of uh, filling in this information, right? So we want to introduce some structure and the simplest way of introducing structure is in the form of a graph. So we'll now assume that let's say users live on some graph and here the simplest model will be uh, uh, a model of a social network with similar tastes. So if these two users are friends, they will have similar tastes, meaning that the columns of this matrix will be similar. So now we can term, uh, talk about smoothness, right? We can regularize this problem by a smoothness term, by the Dirichlet norm that we've seen before. Basically, we can say that the signal that uh, is vector valued, the columns of the matrix, rise smoothly as we go from, uh, from uh, connected users, right? So these models actually have been considered uh, before uh, by, for example, by Kaufman and Gavish or by, by, uh, by Mura. Uh, we did a paper with uh, collaborators from EPFL uh, back in 2014 that, that actually showed that uh, matrix completion with these uh, extra information works much better than without it. We can obviously do the same thing for the rows. We can introduce some structure about the items that we are recommending. Uh, and Obviously, if you look at this problem, the number of variables here is gigantic, right? If this matrix is uh, millions by millions, it, it will contain uh, possibly hundreds of billions or even trillions of variables. So it is typical to factorize these problems. So instead of considering a large matrix, we consider a product of thin uh, factors. And this way, we also bound the rank of the matrix by, by design. And we can apply this regularization to the corresponding uh, column and row factors. And uh, the question is basically, can we do better than just fixed filters? Because if you think of smoothness, it is essentially a low pass filter. Can we learn some optimal filters on these products of graphs? And the, the analogy in classical signal processing is two dimensional Fourier transform. 
when you uh, compute Fourier transform of an image, basically the way you do it, you multiply it by the Fourier matrix uh, uh, from the left, right? So it computes column-wise Fourier transform, you multiply it from the right, it computes uh, row-wise Fourier transform. If you don't like thinking of it this way, you can uh, actually column stack your image into a vector, and then basically this operation will be equivalent to multiplication by a large matrix that is given as a Kronecker product of the two Fourier matrices. So that's why actually we have two-dimensional structure in the frequency of two-dimensional Fourier transform. So in our case, we can think of a closest analogy. Basically, we have a matrix that lives on a Cartesian product of these two graphs, of the graph of user, uh, users and items. And we can define multi-graph Fourier transform, basically multiplying our matrix by the, by the eigenvectors of the respective Laplacians from the left and from the right. We can define multi-graph spectral convolution exactly as before, as point-wise product of the Fourier transforms and the inverse Fourier transform. And we can define uh, the p-variate polynomial filter that is applied to uh, basically the frequencies by taking the powers of the Laplacian, right? So this is an example of how these filters may look like. Here, the horizontal and vertical dimensions correspond to the row and column Laplacian eigenvalues, right? The, the two-dimensional frequencies. And uh, the way that we use it, so basically we call this multigraph convolutional neural network. It allows to extract spatial patterns from this score matrix. We uh, feed it then into recurrent neural network that produces a sequence of incremental updates of the scores. And we repeat this process multiple times. So probably the best way of thinking of this uh, procedure is a kind of learnable diffusion. We start with some known values in the matrix and we diffuse it in a way, uh, basically by some parametric diffusion where we tune the parameters of the diffusion to fit the best the given data. And here you can see an example where we, this is a synthetic matrix, where uh, these are the known values and the blue values represent the unknown ones. So here the root mean square is very large. Think of the score being between zero and five. And after a few instances of this process, you see that the error drops almost to zero and we recover uh, almost perfectly the, the given matrix. So this was a synthetic example. Here are some examples on uh, classical matrix completion in recommender system benchmarks. At least uh, a couple of years ago when we published it, it used to be state of the art, probably not anymore. And in the medical imaging domain, it was applied to the problem of disease classification where you have multiple inputs, for example, multiple imaging modalities or multiple instances of data about patients where some of them may be missing. So imagine that you want to diagnose a patient. One patient has CT scan and maybe some blood test and some other has something else, right? So you have some missing values. So you want to complete these missing values. And in this case, we have uh, uh, the graph of patients that somehow uh, tells us, uh, guides this completion process. And this is also a work from TUM from the group of Navab they show that uh, uh, this method works uh, better than just considering each patient individually. So let's talk a little bit about spatial domain uh, geometric deep learning methods. I should say that this distinction between spectral and spatial methods is a little bit of cheating, but uh, basically our motivation for the filter was from the free analysis, right? We said that we apply uh, a Fourier transform to our signal and then we represent filter as product in the Fourier domain. Basically, uh, as at the end, the resulting filter, for example, if you take polynomial filters, was uh, a local spatial operator, right? But the question is, can we do something better? If you think of the, the, the way that we, uh, we do convolution on an image, essentially it's a sliding window process, right? We, we extract the page of pixels, we multiply this page by, uh, by some filter, and then we move to the next location, right? So in an image, because of, uh, of repetitive grid structure, uh, the very process of extracting the page is exactly the same at each location, right? On a graph, it's, it might be very different. We don't have this uh, analogy of, uh, of pixels because uh, each vertex can be connected to a completely different number of neighbors. So what we can do, we can define some local system of coordinates. We call these pseudo coordinates. They don't need to be actually uh, uh, bijective mapping. And we define a set of weighting functions in this set of coordinates. So think of a local pitch, basically a local mapping of the neighbors of the graph around some vertex. And we have a set of weighting functions uh, around. So you can think of the, uh, these as kind of soft pixels. And we use these soft pixels to aggregate uh, 
uh, to locally average the, the, the feature vectors, the, the, the function on the, on the vertices. We call this the page operator, and then we just uh, multiply each of these pixels uh, by some, uh, some filter coefficient. Right? So here, I'm lazy to write the normalization. It should be also divided by the sum of the, the, the weights. So the right way to write here is proportional. <laughs> okay, so you can think of it as a Gaussian mixture. Right? You can switch between the, the, uh, between the orders of summation. So you can think of it as a Gaussian mixture model, basically where we have uh, the, the, the weighting functions are Gaussians with learnable uh, mean vector and covariance matrix. And uh, their amplitudes are the, the coefficients of the, of the filter. So we call this a mixture model network, or MONET for, for short. Uh, we can apply these ideas to uh, meshes for analysis of 3D shapes. So for, actually, for 3D shapes, there is much more structure than in general graphs. And if I'm talking about uh, 3D shapes, basically, there is a broad variety of how you can represent them. So at one end of the spectrum, you have very ordered volumetric representations. Basically, you can think of a grid of voxels, right? And there you can select your system of coordinates once and for all. So you don't have any ambiguity. I just run a three-dimensional convolution same way as I do two-dimensional convolution on images. On the other part of the spectrum, I can think of my 3D shape as a point cloud. So it's basically a set of three-dimensional points. It is totally unstructured, right? So there, basically, I can apply only the same function to each point, right? So it should be a permutation invariant to the ordering of the points. And here we sit somewhere in the middle. So the graph-based representations, basically, we had some local structure that describes the relations between the, between the vertices. Let's say I can connect nearest neighbors. And here we have permutation invariant, right? So I can permute the neighbors in any way, right? And the Laplacian operator was exactly this. It was invariant to this uh, reordering of the neighbors because it averaged them, right? But I'm arguing that uh, on uh, manifolds or discrete manifolds like meshes, we can do better. Basically, I, there is some ambiguity, but this is a rotation ambiguity. You see that I can rotate. I don't know if you can see it here. I can select the first point, my first neighbor, and then this will determine the order of the rest of the points. For example, I can order them clockwise. Okay. So basically, on meshes, we have uh, invariance to rotations. And uh, basically, what we can do, we can do uh, intrinsic convolutional neural networks. So basically, we want our neural networks to be invariant to deformations of the, of the mesh. So you can think of it that if I consider my uh, three-dimensional object as a Euclidean object, if I deform it or even just rotate it in plane or out of plane of, of the camera, uh, apply the filter to it, the result will be different, right? For example, convolutional neural networks are even not rotation invariant. But if I define the filter on the surface itself, intrinsically, right, it will follow all the deformations. So in some applications, when I need to deal with deformable shapes, this is a very desired property. Basically, I built in this kind of invariance into the model itself, into the neural network architecture. And uh, this allows to reduce vastly, by orders of magnitude, the number of parameters, because I will not be learning these degrees of freedom. They're already there in the model. I will be only learning deviations from this isometric deformation model. So we can define exactly the same way convolutional meshes. Basically, here we have much more structure. We have a local system of coordinates that uh, can be defined in a meaningful way. For example, local uh, geodesic polar system of coordinates. And we can define convolution exactly in the same way using this idea of uh, soft pixels. And uh, these uh, soft weights can be defined in different ways. So here you can see an example of local orientable filters. You can also learn them. So that's exactly what the Monet architecture does. And we applied it to uh, many problems uh, ranging from computer graphics to, to high energy physics. Here you can see an example of uh, finding dense correspondence between uh, human shapes. So the correspondence here is represented by texture. And you can see that there are very little distortions. It produces almost perfect registration between, between these meshes. And another application, it is also a recent paper with colleagues from uh, EPFL, the group of uh, Bruno Correa, where we apply these, uh, 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 this kind of monet architecture to uh, protein design. Basically, we want, uh, I don't know how much you know about proteins, uh, I learned it uh, over the course of collaboration with, with these guys. So basically, in proteins, you're interested in binding. So basically, you have some targets, let's say uh, this cancer target, PDL1 uh, protein, and you want to design a target, which is another pro a binder that is another protein that 
will bind to it. So binding is both geometric and electrostatic complementarity. It is hard to model, but it's easy to learn. So that's exactly what we do. We learn uh, to predict uh, uh, the binders for this protein, and you actually see that the results are, are pretty nice. We can predict almost correctly the, the, the binders with, with high accuracy. We can also predict the binding sites. So for this protein, for example, we uh, predict, uh, this is the heat map of the predicted binding site, and the green shows the, uh, the ground truth. So the prediction is, is very accurate. This appeared on BioArchive a few months ago. We can generalize this process of uh, uh, convolution, and in this case, I will uh, consider point clouds. So we have a collection of points in, uh, in space. They don't have any uh, structure yet, so the simplest way of defining a structure will be in the form of nearest neighbor graph. And basically, we can think of the most general aggregation operator, that is, the only thing that it has to satisfy is being uh, locally permutation invariant. So I want to aggregate information from my neighbors, and I, for this purpose, I, I create an edge feature function. So I take a pair of feature vectors at the vertex i and neighbor vertex i prime. I aggregate them uh, uh, by passing them through this function that is realized as uh, a multi-layer perceptron, a small neural network. And then I aggregate all the edges using this uh, aggregation operator. So we call this edge convolution. And you can think that, uh, uh, basically you can think of uh, the previous methods based on Laplacian or even Monet as particular instances of this problem, right? Laplacian, for example, will consider a particular uh, structure of these functions, which depends on the difference of the points, and it will actually not be learnable. It will be fixed with some fixed weights. But here we can make it learnable. And important thing that when we are dealing with point clouds, we actually can learn the graph itself. We can start with some given graph in the input space, but we can update it uh, by build it in the feature space of the, of the neural network. And uh, the reason to do it is that uh, the, the original geometry of the input space is not necessarily representative of the structure of the task that you're considering. Here you can look at the problem of uh, point cloud segmentation. So that's the supervision signal. We are trying to segment different parts of this airplane. And what I'm visualizing here is the distance uh, from the red point. So you see that initially the, 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 the distance is Euclidean, but as we go deeper into the network, it becomes more and more semantic. You see, for example, that now the near parts will be the two engines of the, of the plane. And, uh, and um, uh, basically this is because we allow to update the graph uh, between the layers of the, of the neural network. And here are some examples, segmentation of chairs. So this, is, this was published in Computer Graphics Community. It had some uh, state-of-the-art results. I'm not sure if, it's, if it is anymore, but it uh, outperformed significantly uh, the previous uh, point cloud-based model, such as PointNet, which doesn't account for any local structure. Here we do it by means of this graph. So let me say a few words about uh, 3D shape synthesis, and then I will wrap up. So shape synthesis, so far we considered analysis problems, right? And if you think of uh, the, the 3D uh, vision or graphics domain, basically we have some, uh, let's say, noisy or partial input, let's say from a 3D scanner or maybe from a, a medical imaging device, and we correspond it to some reference shape. So if we are, for example, if we want to uh, image in real time a 3D human, so that would be the, the case, right? We have some canonical model of the human. The uh, synthesis part, we now want to pose this human in the pose of the input. So we want to generate a new mesh where, which has uh, some uh, desired uh, extrinsic properties. Now here we can think of a difficult problem and a very difficult problem. So the difficult problem is to assume that the connectivity doesn't change. The even more difficult problem is to generate not only the positions of the vertices but also the topology of the mesh, the connectivity. Okay? So almost all the works in this domain look at some fixed mesh. There are very few works that try to look at the synthesis of the connectivity. So uh, we did actually one of the first works, uh, variational autoencoder for meshes. Basically, in this case, it was for shape completion. So basically, we learn a latent space for meshes, for human shapes in this case, and we generate uh, shapes from this latent space. And uh, the idea is to minimize some, uh, uh, some loss with respect to the uh, given partial input. And we showed quite nice completions, maybe not ideal. Here you can see some noisy input from, from the Kinect sensor, and these are the reconstructed meshes. Here are some additional examples. So overall it looks nice, and you can do it much better. 
these are examples of, uh, for example, uh, uh, generative models for faces. So this is uh, work that was done here with uh, my collaborator Stephanos. And some additional examples. So you can do arithmetics in this latent space of the generative model. Uh, and one of the applications we are now trying out is to try to predict facial structure from genetic information, face from DNA reconstruction. This is done with Peter Kleiss from KUL. And we can also do it for hands. So we can reconstruct hands from two-dimensional images. This is uh, another work with Stephanos. And here we have uh, the typical encoder-decoder architecture. And you see that the reconstruction of the hand is pretty am amazing, even with difficult poses and occlusions. So I think I'm out of time, so let me summarize it here. So I hope I convinced you that graphs are natural models of interactions and relations between different kind of things and objects that uh, can also be applied to many problems in medical imaging, for example, considering graphs uh, to model brain connectivity, considering graphs as networks of patients with similar properties. Uh, on many folds, it is also interesting to explore these methods because uh, if you especially deal with deformable intrinsic models, you can build uh, deformation invariance into the model, and this way you can vastly reduce the number of parameters in the model, avoid overfitting, reduce the size of the training sets. So the shape correspondence applications that I showed you actually were trained on just a few, uh, few tens of shapes, as opposed to millions of examples that you typically encounter uh, on, in classical deep learning. Uh, generative models are challenging, especially for graphs. The reason being that you need to somehow solve for correspondence between the input and the output. So I think it is still vastly open field of research. There are interesting theoretical analysis uh, uh, open problems, and especially relations to classical problems in computer science. For example, you can find relation between quadratic assignment and uh, traveling salesman problems and, uh, uh, and deep learning on graphs. And an interesting question is interpretability. So it might be that actually graph-based models offer interpretability because, well, graph is a natural description of relations. So if you get somehow, if you capture these relations, you might have better chances of interpreting your deep learning model. So you can visit this website, geometricdeeplearning.com, for more information. And I would like to credit my multiple collaborators on many of these projects and all the funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for an excellent talk. And uh, I think there are a lot of inspirations coming from this. Uh, so we have time for questions, if you want to ask any questions. So there are two microphones, the one here in the front and one over there. Um, there are also runners. If you want to just raise your hand, we will bring a microphone to you. Any questions from the audience? There's someone waving up there. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was really cool. Um, my first question is probably about the application. Uh, do you have any examples of use of graphs for registration? For instance, I'm thinking about like having CT scan from two years ago and trying to register it to the MRI of today. Good question. So I, I, I'm not from this field exactly, so I don't know. There might be some uh, examples uh, that, that I'm not, uh, not aware of. But uh, basically, uh, if you think of registration of uh, surfaces, right, of meshes, uh, and especially if you are dealing with deformable shapes, like may, probably many uh, human organs, that would probably be a, a good way of uh, uh, thinking or trying to address these problems with genetic deep learning. Okay. And like probably for a follow-up question, what's the requirements for the ground truth for these kind of applications? So probably not very different from the standard uh, deep learning techniques. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, use basically the graph or the, the, the mesh structure to introduce uh, sufficient prior knowledge about your problem, so you will probably need less data. So for the correspondence problems that, that I showed, we used way less data, like three orders of magnitude less compared to the competing methods that use Euclidean uh, models.
I think there's a question out there, yeah? Microphone not working. Thank you very much for the uh, nice talk. Uh, I'm also working on the convolutional neural network and the graph neural network. I'm working on the connection between different modalities, uh, like we create point cloud or mesh from the images. And now I can achieve to use the first part with convolutional and the second part with fully connected to create a point cloud from images. And, uh, but the point cloud, we lost the connectivities between them. So I would like to use convolution and the plus graph neural network to create meshes directly from images. But I feel there are some bottleneck in between, like how can I connect the convolution and the graph, and also the loss function is one of the key bottlenecks. And uh, could you um, maybe briefly comment on, on some possibilities on that direction? Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, well, there are several challenges. So one challenge is uh, basically generating the connectivity. So uh, you need to guarantee, for example, that this is a manifold, uh, uh, manifold uh, mesh, right? So the triangles uh, are, uh, share exactly one, uh, one edge, right, and, and so on. Uh, so there are several approaches, like uh, differentiable version of, uh, of marching cubes. So I've seen I've seen uh, this uh, this work, deep marching cubes that basically uh, construct triangulation uh, in a differentiable way. So you can put it in uh, in your deep learning pipeline. So that might be one way of, uh, for example, of uh, let's say segmenting a volumetric image and and constructing a mesh. And then on this mesh, you can define uh, convolution operations, like uh, in the way that that I showed. Could be one way, but uh, I guess there will be many more. There's a question at the very top, behind you. Just, just don't walk down. Oh, sorry, there was another. One. Uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, I had one question regarding the learning of the graph structure in dynamic uh, graph convolutions, and uh, you using uh, in, intermediate stages, you can use features uh, you derive from, from the data itself, but I think in the, in the very first step, you, you used the Euclidean um, point coordinates. Is, does that introduce some sort of bias into the kind of structures you can learn from the data, kind of relying too much on the, on the input uh, Euclidean coordinates, or is there a way to avoid this bias? Well, so it, it, it really depends on the application. So in this case, uh, the input is point cloud. So think in the simplest setting, it's just uh, 3D coordinates of the points. So uh, the basic thing you can do is something that PointNet does. So it, you, you, you apply a shared function to each of the point, right? So basically, you have global permutation invariants. So the slightly better way, uh, basically, of modeling local structure is to, uh, to, let's say, design some epsilon graph or or nearest neighbor graph and say that I have uh, this local connectivity structure. Of course, it might be noisy, incorrect. I might break the topology, for example, uh, and so on. So there, there are many, many issues with this. But at least it gives you some idea about the structure. Now you apply this convolution, like this edge convolution operation that allows you to aggregate information from local neighbors so you can do some, something smooth. So, so you don't uh, treat each point uh, separately, right? So uh, now. Basically, whether you need to keep the graph, uh, the initial graph, throughout all your layers of the convolutional neural network is again application dependent. So if you're solving some semantic task like segmentation, maybe the initial uh, graph is not representative of the, uh, the output uh, uh, clusters, right, or segments that you will obtain. So it, it makes sense to basically to recompute it throughout the layers. So you can do it every layer, or you can do it from time to time, maybe towards the end. Uh, and uh, this way, you basically you, you facilitate the network to learn the, the, the right features, to, to connect the right things, right? So we've seen that it helps. Not a lot, but you can gain something like 1% of accuracy in the ShapeNet model um, uh, benchmark. I think we have time for an, one more question. Okay. Thank you for a great talk. In the back. Yep. <laughs> um, thinking about the problems of um, uh, collaborative filtering, I think the mic just went out. 
Thank you. Um, thinking about the problems of collaborating filtering or, for example, diagnosis of some patients based on the um, labels of other patients. Uh, thinking about that setup, it seems that the real setup is that I'm, we are given a graph and then we are adding one more point to the graph. Uh, could you speculate on that setting? Sure. So I think probably the closest analogy here will be point clouds, right? You don't really have a patient graph. This is something that you invent. It's not a social network where you know that two people are friends. Here you presume that uh, patients are related based on some common properties, but you, you don't really know it, right? So uh, you can probably think of patients as a point cloud in some high dimensional feature space where the features could be, I don't know, gender, age, uh, disease property, disease history, whatever. And uh, basically you try to establish relations there. So you can basically parameterize maybe in terms of some, uh, some kernel, right? Some, I don't know, in the simplest case, maybe Mahalanobis metric or something like this some uh, kernel that will allow you to define a graph, right, nearest neighbor graph, and when a new patient comes, you will know how to connect it to, to, to previous patients. So I should also say that it's not exactly uh, diagnosing a patient from the diagnosis of uh, the neighbors, but it's using uh, the overall structure to regularize your decisions. But it seems silly to solve the problem all from scratch by, uh, when you add one patient. So I'm curious what you think about how to solve this problem locally rather than resolving, resolving it for now a new graph. Sure, but I, I don't think that you necessarily need to solve it uh, from scratch. Basically, all the operators that I described are local. So if you add a new patient, maybe you just need to do a few updates. So you don't, maybe not, you don't really need to recompute everything. But uh, I should say that uh, I wish that we got to the sizes of the data sets where computation would be prohibitive because even in the, in the, in the base, uh, best largest data sets that, we, uh, that I've seen at least, you might have maybe a few thousands, maybe 10,000 patients. Uh, these kind of computations take a few seconds. So uh, I think it's not yet a computational bottleneck. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this closes our first session, but let's thank Michael again for an excellent talk. <laughs>